Let's talk circulation. Like I promised, this is going to be about a high, month of high school in the next hour and a half. I have your lab exams. High score was a 94 or 95. Lowest score was in the C's. Why? Because you're welcome. I was nice. Uh, objectives, I just need to enter the scores in, and then I can give them back to you. Last semester, this took three days. I'm going to try and do it faster, because we're missing a day. When we look at circulation, one of the things that matters is how we need to do our circulation. And part of what's important about circulation is how you're built. So we haven't really thought of how animals are built yet. But with circulation, you have to take it into consideration. And the reason why is if you are an organism with a gastrovascular cavity, there's no need to, for circulation. All you need is diffusion, because everything is so small. So you look at a moon jelly being eaten by creepy little kids at the Aquarium of the Pacific. There's no need for circulation, because there are a handful of cells thick. Diffusion works just fine. They're also in a watery environment. What's the point of having circulating blood? Same thing if you had a some type of nematode, or excuse me, not nematode, but platy helminth. They're flat. There's no need for circulation because they're not big enough to really require anything that would involve circulation. Easy enough. Sweet, we already dealt with all those. The catch becomes, once we move past these things that have gastrovascular cavities, so we start moving into what we would call the coelomates, where you actually have a body cavity, now circulation gets a little bit more complicated. We put everything into two categories, open and closed circulation. In both cases, what we're going to need to have will be a liquid to pump around. We give it a name, blood. We need to have the pump, we call it, heart. And then we need to have tubes. We give them several names. Arteries, veins, capillaries. Do you know any others? We have small arteries. They're called arterioles. Because eol means small. We have small veins. We call them venules. U-L-E-S. Because eul means small. We have another one that I've mentioned once before with individuals who had, who had a radical mastectomy. Lymph nodes. So not the nodes themselves, but lymph vessels. The nodes are just spots along the lymph vessels. Those are our tubes. We have lots of tube options. Basic idea. If you have open circulation, what you're going to have is some large area where blood just dumps in. Where is that going to be? The vital organs. where digestion occurs, where brain turns out to be, where a majority of the muscles are found, where there's going to be lots of ventilation, that's where we're going to dump all of our blood. We call that area the hemolymph. And the big cavity is referred to as a sinus. So the, I misspoke. The blood is called hemolymph. The cavity is called a sinus. 
So that would be a lot of your arthropods. That polyphyletic group. It's why when you hit one on your windshield, you actually get a legit splat. Splat, kind of like you had a water balloon filled with paint and you tossed it and it went splat. Why? Because they are water balloons filled with blood. So when you hit it, it goes splat. What would it look like if you ran into something that didn't have this? Well, one, you're not talking about humans and you're creepy. But two, you wouldn't splat like this. You don't splat like they do because you're not a bag. Even though every single one of you, most likely when you were younger, or I don't know, maybe you still do, are kind of somehow convinced like, yeah, it's kind of like just a big bag of blood inside of you. Why? Because whenever you get cut, you just bleed. So clearly it's just a bag of blood. Without thinking the fact that it's actually all trapped in tubes, and what you're really doing is ripping the tubes open. The other option is what we call closed circulation. Blood stays in tubes. It does not leave the tubes. We can have fluid exchange, but fluid exchange does not involve blood exchange. The fluid exchange occurs in structures that look like this. So here's where we would have fluid exchange. But the blood stays trapped in the tube. What typically happens at these fluid exchange locations is the blood plasma will move. But the cells need to stay put which means, strictly speaking, blood never leaves the tube. If blood does leave the tube, we need to turn that process off, and that's the job of the platelets to make a blood clot. Here, there's one heart. There's no guarantee that you have one heart. We can have multiple hearts. Some of them look complex, like the mammalian heart. Some of them are really simple, like in an earthworm. Why point that out? Because it's irksome when people mischaracterize things in the name of forcing opinions onto other people about heartbeats. If you're going to say it, at least be correct about it. As you can tell, I'm probably a joy to be around with my father. <laughs> I've told you how he votes, yes? Closed circulation, you have to keep the blood in the tubes. Blood is meant to stay in the tubes. The pathways, we're going to ignore basically everything that's not a vertebrate. And the reason why is it's complicated. Because dumping the blood into a chamber. Now we have to worry about how do you get the blood back into the blood vessels. And oh, let's just, let's just bypass it all. So let's deal with the vertebrates. When we look at the vertebrates, there are three distinct sets of circulatory patterns that we find. All of them are going to follow a really simple pathway. What we're going to see is there's always going to be two different sets of directions. One of those is going to be referred to as a systemic circuit. One of them is going to be refer referred to as the pulmonic circuit. The systemic circuit is meant for organs, period. This is going to be oxygen to your organs. The job of the pulmonic circuit is to put oxygen into your blood. Which means what we need to have at least, so with this exchange, this circuit requires one set of capillaries. The pulmonic requires a separate set of capillaries. So to really go through circulation, what you have to do is you need to go through the systemic circuit and the pulmonic circuit to make 
the complete journey. You have to run through both of them. So what patterns do we see? The pattern tends to be this. We're always going to go, I'm going to pick an arbitrary starting point because they're circles. There is no start. But let's just pick the heart. What we're going to do is go from an atrium to a ventricle to an artery. I'm just going to pick on the ones that we can see easily to a vein to an atrium, to a ventricle, to an artery, to a vein, to an atrium, to a ventricle, to an artery, to a vein, to an atrium, to a ventricle, to an artery, to a vein. Everything is going to follow an A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B pattern. The catch is you need a few A, Bs in order to get back to where you were beginning. So if I look at a fish, that's exactly what I see. I go from an atrium to a ventricle to an artery to a vein, to an atrium, to a ventricle, to an artery, to a vein, to an atrium, to a ventricle, to an artery, to a vein. Here, it turns out we only need one atrium and one ventricle. An atrium is the receiving chamber. The ventricle is the pumping chamber. Why do they need one atrium and one ventricle? Is it because fish are small? Well, take a look at the whale shark. Largest fish on Earth. Tell me about its heart. Atrium ventricle. Why, why does it not have a more complicated heart? We need to have more complicated hearts if I have gravity to fight against. If there's no gravity to fight against, why do I need to have a complicated heart? Which means they don't need it. They just need to get the blood to go in a complete circuit. That's all they need. We have to make it go through two circuits. One of them is pretty easy, and the other one has feet, lots of feet involved. Depending on how tall you are, it gets even harder for it to work. It's why Godzilla is never going to be possible. Science people ruin all movies. Godzilla is like, what, 300 feet tall, something like that? Not physically possible. Not on Earth. Like, it, Godzilla would just be crushed under the weight of Godzilla. Like, none of it's possible. That it has, like, atomic breath. I think. Come on, clearly. But the movies are fun. So the moment we start moving on to land, we need to start breaking up the circulation because the pressure you need to move through going through the systemic circuit is going to be different than the pressure you need to move through the pulmonic circuit. So we need to start to separate them out. We look at amphibians, we're going to start to see a separation of a pulmonic and a systemic circuit. The catch is they will have two atria one each to represent the receiving side, but they don't really separate out the ventricle. The ventricle is just going to be a bigger version where we're going to hopefully do our best to separate blood that goes to the pulmonary circuit versus that which goes to the systemic circuit. Here this says pulmocutaneous, and that's because amphibians breathe through their skin. It's why you're not supposed to touch frogs, toads, salamanders, whatever, with your bare hands. Because whatever you have on your hands, you are shoving it into their lungs. So you're not supposed to touch them with your hands. It's also why they're particularly sensitive to what's going on in the water supplies. Because they breathe through their skin. You're polluting the water, you're suffocating them. It's why they're all going extinct, because we're polluting them. Also, the, uh, they're having a fungus issue. Eventually, you get to us mammals, where we have a total separation of the pulmonic circuit and the systemic circuit. So we'll end up having 
a right atrium and ventricle, and we'll have a left atrium and ventricle. So, a note. You look at this. Left and right. Hopefully one of you had a thought of the L's for the left side, right? This this don't work. Whenever you look at anything dealing with anatomy, it is always based upon you staring at it. It's never to make the orientation match how you are. It's always how you observe it. So when we start talking about rights and lefts, this is the left side, this is the right side. Even though your brain says, mm, that that's not true, and the answer is, yes, it is your perspective on the picture is wrong. So this makes it a little bit more complicated when we start dealing with a mammalian circulatory system or an avian circulatory system. Where we go, left ventricle, artery, capillary, I'm throwing in the capillaries, vein, right atrium, right ventricle, artery, capillary, vein, left atrium, to your left ventricle, hit repeat. So here we're just taking our pattern of AV, AV, and we're just making it a little bit more complicated, where we have lefts and we have rights. So here turns out to be the human version. The big artery that's going to be the takeaway from the right side of your lung is going to be called the pulmonary artery. It's also labeled right there. The one that's going to head back towards your heart is going to be called the pulmonary vein. The one that's going to leave your heart that you all had to attempt to hunt down is your aorta. The ones that are coming back to your heart are going to be called the inferior and superior don't know what happened with an accent there. Superior vena cava. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. Superior and inferior vena cava. They were named in Latin, so we have to use the Latin plural. You don't have vena cavas. You have vena cavi. What is strange name? Cavi sounds like the word cave. Vein. It's the cavernous vein. Why? Because if you look at them, they're big fat veins. A E. When we look at blood vessels, okay, yay. There turn out to be several sets of blood vessels. The smallest of them are what we call capillaries. So of these capillaries, they are going to be the easiest to describe. They are made out of simple squamous epithelium, which means in your mind, instantly, you can envision those little crepe-like cells that were kind of hard to see that kind of wrap around in what we saw with your lungs. That's what capillaries turn out to be. They're crepes, except you just take the crepe and you wrap it into a tube. These are so small that every cell in your body is within two cell diameters of a capillary. If I were to make it so all the capillaries in your body were solid and we then deleted everything else. All your organs are gone. All your other blood vessels are gone. All we see are your capillaries. You would look the exact same except you wouldn't have any color and you wouldn't have any hair. You have the exact same shape you have right now. And if we were to look, move up close to you and stare at you, you would look solid because that is how many capillaries you have. It is quasi-unfathomable 
how many capillaries you have. I say within two cell diameters, that doesn't mean anything. So if I were to take the average, nope, the average human cell, it's something on the order of 20 microns in diameter. For perspective, you walk outside a month and a half ago. The spiders were in spider season. You know how you can walk outside your front door and you know when you walk, like, you don't, you didn't see that spider web, you walk into it, and I, no, 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 and you start freaking out. But sometimes when you walk out and the light's hitting it just right, you're like, and you start moving around and then you're like, there it is, I barely make out a sheen. You can barely see that there was a spider web there. That's 100 microns. That's you having issues staring at it. That is the size of a human egg. A human egg is about 100 microns. If we were to take a human egg and stick it inside of a Petri dish and put it on a white piece of paper, and I would say, but point at the cell, most of you would be staring at it and saying, there's no cell there. And some of you would be like, I think I, I think I saw a dot, but I'm not sure. That's the largest cell we produce. And by we, I mean half of the human population. The other half, I don't know what we're good for. <laughs> the average human cell is a fifth of the smallest thing that you can see with your naked eye. The largest distance you will ever have between capillaries is about 40 microns. So we have capillary, two cells, we have a capillary. That's how many capillaries we have. It's indescribable how many we have. Form implies function. Capillaries are super -de duper -de thin, which means they're just there for a shape. They're there for, for nutrient exchange. So all fluid nutrient exchanges that occur, occur at capillaries because they are small enough to allow it to happen. How small can they get? Well, again, Average human cell, about 20 microns in diameter. Mm, nah, nah, okay. That's about a third of the distance across this one right here. It's about. So that's going to be about seven microns. That's a red blood cell. Capillaries can be so small that red blood cells have to fold in half. To fit through. So how small are these things? Definitely smaller than we can imagine. They also come in two flavors. Flavor one is called fenestrated. Flavor two is non-fenestrated. We just need to understand what the word fenestrated means. Ah, I was waiting for the head bob. Fenestrated means window. Well, how do you make a window? You have a wall and you punch a hole in it. Ta-da, you made a window. So fenestrated would mean if I were to look at this capillary, I can make out little cracks in it. That's all we mean by fenestrated. There's little spaces in between the cells. Why do we care? It's leakier. That's not leakier. There we go. That's leakier. These little holes allow for more fluid to leak through. Got it. 
when you happen to get a duct on your nose, or more appropriately, on your forehead, always has to be your forehead, that gets clogged due to oils, and then it causes bacteria to say, I love oil, I want to eat more of this, but it's trapped. They're not surrounded by oxygen, which means they're not being murdered by poison gas. So they say, thank you, and they start reproducing more and more and more, but this ends up pissing off your body, and they start to swell up in their little chamber. And it pisses it off so much that your immune system gets called on in, and they start, hey, what you all doing in here? And they start like killing them all. But in the shootout bang bang, it kills off some of the white blood cells too. So we get this pile up of all these white tissues that sometimes starts to push its way through your skin. What am I describing? A pimple or a zit? What's causing the redness? It's a phenomenon called inflammation. So inflammation, here's a little bit of immune system talk for us. Nah, that's not how you spell the word inflammation. So inflammation has five signs according to the ancients. This makes you sound smart if you could say these. It comes with dolor, actually dolor, sorry, two O's. Dolor is pain. It comes with rubor. Sounds like the word ruby. Redness comes with calor, heat, comes with turgor, swelling, also comes with the last one, Functio lassi. Doesn't work. Tell me, you sprain your ankle and it swells up. How much do you want to walk? You don't. Oh, the function has gone down. Hmm. How can we get all these to occur? Part of the chemicals that trigger inflammation can turn non-fenestrated capillaries into fenestrated capillaries. What happens? They swell up. If they swell up, the cracks become visible between them. We see the fenestra. Well, what does that mean? You get more blood flow. What color is blood? Red. You're now having more blood flow to the area. Is blood hot or cold? It's hot. We have holes. The holes allow for leakiness. So it's going to swell up. When that starts to happen, all that pressure is going to start shoving itself onto your nerves. And as we recall, whacking a nerve hurts. And when something hurts, do you want to do it? No. All of inflammation can be explained by turning non-fenestrated capillaries into fenestrated capillaries. Every single bit. The only thing I haven't told you about is the chemical that would trigger it. And you all probably know the chemical, especially if you have allergies. Because you take a drug to stop it, called an antihistamine. Histamines will do this. How could we demonstrate this? Simple. I'll hop online black market, because there's going to be some questions if I were to order it normally. And I'm going to order 100 micrograms of pure histamine. I'll then ask one of you, who wants an A in this class and you don't need to show up again? <laughs> All the guys will say, me! The ladies are going to be like, mm, mm, don't trust the white guy. I'll take and pluck up one crystal of the histamine, I'm going to say, which arm do you not like? And you'll say, uh, this one. And all I'm going to do is take it, and I'm just going to tap it into your skin. Don't even need to break skin, but I'm just going to push it on in. What's going to happen? Within about 30 seconds, the arm is going to start swelling up. It's then going to start to spread. 
And depending on how close we stab it towards your chest, you're going to stop breathing because of the, how bad the inflammation will get. That's why you get the A and you're done for the rest of the semester because you're going to be in a hospital for a while. <laughs> That's the power of switching from non-fenestrated to fenestrated. <laughs> and admit it. Some of the guys are like, still might be worth it. Still might be worth it. Oh, no, he has the look of like, Chris would so say yes. <laughs> anyway, next two. Arteries and veins, they're the ones everyone likes to think about. Arteries turn out to have three different layers to them. They have fancy Latin names. We don't care. There are two different versions of arteries. We have what we call the elastic arteries. And we have muscular arteries. The ones that we typically think of are being elastic. So what's elastic? Not stretch. It's stretch, but go back to the original shape. That's the key. It has to go back to the original shape. So why do we care? What happens in arteries is you're going to pump it full of blood. And as you pump it full of blood, it's going to swell up. But what it needs to then do is push itself back to its original shape. Who cares? When it goes back to its original shape, it's pushing blood out at a constant rate. The result is we're going to maintain blood pressure and keep blood flowing at a nice, constant rate rate. So it's not blood, no blood. Blood, no blood. Blood, no blood. We don't play that game. It's constant flow of blood at all times. And that's because arteries can stretch, but then go back to their shape. Muscular arteries can change their shape. They can make themselves wider or narrower. These are most or mostly demonstrated in what we call the arterioles. Arterioles are small arteries. Got it. If you're curious what the layers are, they're shown here. You have connective tissue on the outside or uh, up to up yeah, epithelial tissue on the outside, epithelial on the inside, then you have a muscle and elastic layer in the middle. Arterioles are famous because they control blood flow through capillaries. That, until recently, I thought was a white person specialty until some of you demonstrated how red you could turn your face. <laughs> what makes, what does the blush? It's release the kraken and let a whole bunch of blood start rushing to your face. That's what causes the blush. It's controlled or it's shifting where the blood flow turns out to be. It's why when you blush, you get that warm sensation on your face. And that's because there's more blood flow to your face, and you can feel it. Sometimes the blood flow happens. You can feel the rush, but it doesn't manifest in the skin. But it does change the electrolytes. You will have a slight shift in the leakage. We use that. It's called a polygraph test. That's how the lie detector test works. They're checking if you're blushing, even if it doesn't show, because the control of your arterioles is not for you to consciously regulate. And it turns out, if you know that you're caught in a lie, even if you don't act it, you know how sometimes you get that feeling of like, oop, like, 
almost like you started to blush and you get that weird rushing sensation, that's because you are blushing. It's not physically manifesting, but if we were checking ion levels, we can find it. That's why it's hard to beat a polygraph. How do you do it? You have to just have that ability of not having it happen. That's nothing you can necessarily train. That's just, congratulations, you're an awful person. Veins, not saying you're an awful person. You don't get a say in this. Veins are also like arteries. They have those three layers. The difference between them is they're not elastic. They actually have the ability to have huge size fluctuations. And the reason for that is at any given moment in time, about 60% of your blood is sitting in your veins. It's just sitting there waiting to be put back into circulation. Put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. The catch is, because they don't have that squeezingness of the elasticity, blood pressure is now an issue. Blood flows due to blood pressure. And here, we don't have high blood pressure, which means blood can move backwards. We don't want blood rushing back towards your feet. So what we need to do is prevent blood from moving the wrong way. Those are what we call valves. In particular, these are what we would de deem to be venous valves. The last of these blood vessels are lymph nodes. Lymph vessels are a weirdo, namely because they don't carry blood. Lymph vessels only carry the plasma. That's all they get to carry is plasma. They don't carry blood. They usually are referred to as blind capillaries. And the reason why we call them a blind capillary is they're found in capillary beds, but they have an ending. It's not a continuous circuit. There's just a tube that just ends right there, like this one right here. And that's what we would call a blind lymph capillary. The tube, as it moves away, so this would be the lymph capillary, this would be the lymph vessel. So the capillary is the end, further away you get, it's the lymph vessel. These all turn out to have valves in them because it's a low pressure system. They all pass through lymph vessels on the way back to dumping the contents back into your circulation. There's two main drains. One of them is going to be on your right arm. The other is going to be in the middle of your chest. It's why if you have the radical mastectomy, it's your right arm and only your right arm that swells up. Because that's in your chest, that's where the drop-off point is. And when you have a radical mastectomy, that part here that I circled, that's chopped out. So all of this drainage here doesn't happen, and your arm's going to swell up. It also turns out to be how cancer spreads throughout your body. So when ca cancer starts to metastasize and it's spreading, it spreads through the lymph. It's why they start freaking out if it's looking like it's spreading. How, where is it in your lymphatics? Because the further away it can get, the more cancer you can get. Yeah. So let's make the heart do its thing. Structure of your heart, it's really basic. You have atria, you have ventricles. How can you tell them apart? Because if you were to draw your heart like this, that's not what your heart looks like. It actually kind of sort of does. It's not this exaggerated, but it is pretty close. You can break it up into four chambers. The top portion that looks like the A is the atrium. 
The bottom portion that has the V shape is the ventricle. You can tell them apart rather easily. The ventricles are very muscular. The atria are not. Easy enough. How do you tell the right from the left? The musculature again gives it away. Because the left side of your heart needs to pump everywhere. So it has to pump from your heart to the bottom of your toes and give it enough oomph that it can make it back up. Your right ventricle needs to pump a couple of inches to the right and to the left. So your right ventricle is going to be really small. Your left ventricle is going to be really big. Why am I telling you this? Because guess what you get to dissect on Thursday? Hearts. No, because they'd be too small. So how can we then make sure that we have blood flowing the right way? Well, we need to have heart valves. The point of the valves is to ensure one directional flow, so we call that preventing retrograde flow. Retrograde, of course, meaning backwards. There are two sets. Set number one are called the AV valves. AV for atrioventricular. You have a left AV valve and you have a right AV valve. We call them atrioventricular valves because they are at the split between atrium and ventricle. Atrium, ventricle. Right here would be another AV valve. So here's atrium, here's ventricle. You can technically call them left and right AV valves. You are weird. The left atrioventricular valve also goes by the name of the two flap valve. Well, we need a fancy way of saying two flap because two flap is just way too ordinary. So we need two is by and a flap is a cusp. So we call this the by cuspid. On your right side, it has three flaps. So we call it the tricuspid. But we need to complicate this sucker even more. The two flap one has a very odd shape to it. That when it's open kind of gives this type of shape. Kind of like a beak, but it domes around. So it's like this weird pointy round hat that when it was first identified made people think of church cardinals. So they started thinking of Catholicism. Namely because it looked like a hat you would see them wear. The hat has a name. It's called a mitre. M-I-T-R-E. So we also call this the mitral valve. Which one is the correct name? When you're in med school, whichever one they tell you to use, that is the correct name. They are all, all of those are technically correct. We also have these other ones called SL or semilunar valves. We call them semilunar because in profile, they look like a pair of butt cheeks. Or, that's like a crescent moon, and that's a crescent moon, which is part of a moon, or a semi-moon, or semi-lunar. Of course, we have 
other names for them. So we can say the left semilunar and the right semilunar. The one on the left leads to the aorta, so we call it the aortic semilunar, or you could just say the aortic valve. Similarly, on the right side, it leads to the pulmonary artery, so we call it the pulmonary semilunar, or the pulmonic valve. It's not bad. Which is the correct word? Whatever your med school tells you it's supposed to be. I am more than capable of understanding six different terms to apply. So you may use whichever you wish. I will understand what you're saying. They will too. They're just looking for reasons to kick you out. Which seems rude, but hey, they're keeping your hundred grand. What's it to them? So let's make the blood flow through the heart. The diagram is relatively easy, especially because I can remember that AV thing. So remember, blood flow is atrium to ventricle to artery to vein. That vein leads to the atrium. So to figure out the flow, we can actually make it so I can even put valves in now. I can take this vein, atrium, ventricle, artery, and I can now insert valves. So we'd never named a valve between a vein and an atrium. But we did name a valve between the atrium and the ventricle. Those were the AV valves. So here we'll have an AV valve. Between the ventricle and the artery, we also named valves. Those are your semilunar valves. Notice how they both are associated with the ventricle. turns out to be a mildly important observation. They're both associated with the ventricle. To get blood to flow, we need to have a pump. The pump needs to have some power behind it. Power in your body comes from muscle contraction. So it's cardiac muscle that's going to be driving the motion. Well, where do we find the bulk of the cardiac muscle? in the ventricle, or at least around the ventricle. The ventricle is actually a chamber. So when we look at the heart, what you actually have is just a collection of muscle that surrounds chambers. How do we hold it all into place? How do we make sure that the correct areas have the correct amount of muscle? That's what we call the fibrous skeleton of the heart. You have a whole bunch of connective tissue that kind of keeps all the cardiac muscle in the right spot. When the, when the cardiac muscle contracts, we give it a word, which is that one, pronounced systole. Pronounce the E at the end. So it's pronounced systole. So muscle contracts, in particular, cardiac muscle contracts, it's called systole. So if the, when it relaxes, we call it, now that you know how systole is pronounced, how do you suppose this other word's pronounced? It's a matter of getting the correct rhythm of the word. Diastole. Diastole. So, cardiac muscle contracts, it squeezes. 
systole. It stops. It relaxes. Diastole. The chamber pumps. Systole. The chamber relaxes. Diastole. It turns out we get a pattern between systoles and diastoles. What you'll have is when both sets of chambers are relaxed, we get open blood flow. And the blood will go from vein to atrium to ventricle. What will then happen is the atrium is going to undergo systole, so it's going to squeeze. And what that's going to do is ensure whatever blood is inside of the atria gets shoved into the ventricles. Got it. So it's like making sure everything's filled up. What will then happen is the atria are going to go into diastole. They're going to calm down. But the ventricles are going to go into systole. The catch is I want blood to go from ventricle to artery. I don't want blood to go from ventricle to atrium. Why do we have those semi, or excuse me, the atrioventricular valves? To prevent the blood from going ventricle to atrium. It's a, it's a door that's slamming shut. How do you know it's a door that slams shut? Because it's one of your heart sounds. It's one of the things you hear when you listen to your heartbeat. It's of the It's the first hit, is that one, slamming shut. It's dubbed, it's actually not dubbed dub, it's pronounced lub. So it's lub. What then happens is your ventricle is going to calm down, and when it calms down, it goes into diastole. The result is it relaxes. The valves open up again. The blood can flow through. The catch is, what I didn't bring up last time, is blood in your arteries are then going to try and come back down. Well, that's the wrong direction. Blood's not supposed to go that way. So we have your semilunar valves that will slam shut and not let blood go from arteries to ventricles. That is your the second sound that you hear. Those valves slamming shut. And those are deemed dub. Lub. Dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. Why is there a pause? Because there's another step in there. Lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. Happens that way every second for every minute of every hour of every day of every year of every decade you have been alive. It has never failed to keep that pattern. How do I know it hasn't failed you? Because you're not dead. And if you live to be 115 years old, it's not going to fail until you stop being 115 years old. It is remarkable what it does. This is going to be the last thing I point out to you, which is the thing that does it, the muscle. Cardiac muscle is striated, meaning if you look at it, you can see the stripes. So it's made out of sarcomeres. It's totally obvious. The giveaway that I'm looking at cardiac muscle and not skeletal muscle is cardiac muscle has branches. So if you look, you literally can see a cell splitting. And when they run into each other, you can see where the cells join up. There are these lines right here, these dark little lines. These lines are called intercalated discs. You all know what the term intercalate means? you do this, you have intercalated your fingers. It's just when they 
interdigitate is interpolate. So what we actually have here are we have extensions that kind of snap in between. What are those connections? A term that you haven't thought about in a year. Gap junctions. What do gap junctions allow for? Cells to directly talk to each other. All that hormone crap, none of it applies. We can talk directly cell to cell. Or what we would refer to as an electrical synapse. The result of this is if one of these cells contracts, it has a depolarization, we can send the information not through the cell surface and having to send neurotransmitters, but it goes directly from one cell to the next cell to the next cell. So I see a contraction here, followed by a contraction here, followed by a contraction here. I see a wave of contraction to the point where all the tissue acts as one. Fancy phrase for everything behaves as one is called a functional, that second word. This is Christian position. Sin sishum is the way that's pronounced. I know, it's, it's letting you all see how the word is tried on your own, and then, okay, here's how it's pronounced. Functional sin sishum, meaning it behaves as one. And the other things that this turns out to do, unlike skeletal muscle, where you have to tell it, yo, do your job, do your job, do your job, you do not need to tell your heart. Cardiac muscle has inherent rhythmicity, which, if we move it away from nerd speak, means it beats on its own. It dances to its own rhythm. And you don't need to tell it that it needs to have its own rhythm. You can influence it, but on its own, it will beat just fine. There's a movie, Last Stupid Thing, that came out in 40 years ago. It was called Temple of Doom. It was an Indiana Jones movie. For the most part, stupid movie. Very stupid movie. But they had one part that was somewhat correct. Which was the pull, like you can't like sit down like, like and pull a heart out of a chest, like that that's not a thing. But when it does happen and when the voodoo guy did it and you saw the heart that was still beating, that's legit. I can pull the heart out of your chest and it will beat on its own until it dies. It depends on where you put it. If you put it into a high oxygen environment where you're providing it with nutrients, it'll last a long time. Because it doesn't need your brain to tell it what to do. <laughs>